Welcome back to the One Chart at a Time video series. I'm your host, John Schwabish. Have you ever made a bar chart where you have so many bars, maybe next to each other, maybe stacked together, that is just impossible to read and there's just not enough white space and it's too dense and too cluttered? Well, that's where the dot plot can come into great use. And today we have Cole Nussbaumer Naflick from Storytelling with Data to help us understand how to read and create and use the dot plot. Cole, over to you. Hi, this is Cole, and I'm excited today to be talking with you about dot plots. So the term dot plot really just refers to any graph where you're encoding information with a dot or a circle. Now, more specifically, when people say dot plots, they're usually referring to one of a few types of different graphs. Let's actually take a look at each of these. Uh, so historically, dot plots were used to encode distributions. So for example, my family has chickens. And uh, chickens, so laying chickens, will each ultimately lay about an egg per day. And it's when they become about four to six months in age that the chickens start laying eggs. And so as ours started laying eggs, we started tracking how many eggs we received per day. So we have nine chickens, so ultimately we should be getting about nine eggs per day. However, it didn't start off quite that way. Let's take a look at our egg laying distribution. So here the x-axis shows the number of eggs laid per day, and each dot encodes the data for a given day. Uh, so this was over the first four weeks of egg laying. So we see the distribution here, and actually that's where it can be useful to use a graph like this, is when you want to see the shape of your data, or if you want to be able to identify outliers. Now, as you can imagine, this works best typically for small data sets, uh, especially if you're drawing them by hand, as I've done here. Um, similar to a histogram, the difference between dot plots of this type and histograms is that the dots don't necessarily have to be uniformly spaced along the x-axis. When you do have bigger data sets you're dealing with, that's when you want to reach for a histogram or maybe even a box plot. Now, there's another type of dot plot that I find more commonly used today uh, in the media, in business settings. This one was developed by William S. Cleveland, and because of that is commonly known as a Cleveland dot plot. And it's used to encode data typically across categories. And so we can think of it as an alternative to a bar chart. So for example, here's a simple bar chart. Here we're looking at our advertising spend across a number of different categories. Now imagine if instead of bars, I encoded those endpoints of those bars with a circle. So I do that, I can actually get rid of the bars. Notice the circle actually gives me some space to be able to label the data there directly as well. Then I can think about, because of that, getting rid of my x-axis labels altogether. And now we have what's known as a Cleveland dot plot. So notice currently the dots feel like they're floating around in space a little bit. So if we wanted to add some structure, some scaffolding to our graph, we could add some light grid lines to achieve that effect. Now one benefit of dot plots like this over a bar chart, for example, is you actually don't have to begin your axis at zero with a dot plot. It's because of the way we read something like this. We're focusing more on the position of those dots in space relative to each other versus their position relative to the axis like we would with a bar chart. Let's look at a twist on this. Uh, let's imagine that we have some more data that we want to layer on here as well. Let's go back for a moment to our bar chart. And I'm actually just going to shift those over so I can add another series of data. And now we're still looking at advertising spend, but now it's our spend versus one of our competitors. So I can do the same thing here where I add some dots to the ends of those bars, take away the bars. Notice now I don't need that difference in spacing so I can collapse that down. And with some formatting, I can really get people to focus on the difference between those two sets of data. And now we have what's known as a connected dot plot. And these, uh, 
are super versatile and you see them used relatively frequently in the media, some good use cases in the business world too. And now John asked me to share an example, but I have a hard time limiting it just to one. So I want to show you a few different examples quickly just to give you a sense of the versatility that we can get with this sort of graph. So one thing that we can use it to plot is group comparisons. So in this example, we're looking at the proportion of women versus proportion of men who smoke across different countries. Now, just check out how many different comparisons we can make with this data. I can see where the gap is small. I can see where the gap is large. I could compare the black dots across a different country or the orange or the black to the orange. One thing to keep in mind with the connected dot plot is when one series is always above the other, except in rare cases, that can be a little bit difficult to see. So for example, here, even though it's called out in the title, I had to look at this data for a while before it struck me that the orange dots are higher in Iceland and Sweden, the top two countries, which is not the case everywhere else. So when you want to point that nuance out, you sometimes want to encode that data differently. Let's take a look at another example where that's done. So here now we're looking at another potential use case for a dot plot, which is comparing two points in time. So we're here we have the pricing of Big Macs across different countries between January 2018 and July 2018. And notice here we can easily pick out the cases where pricing was stable or increasing because of the different formatting that's used there. Now, another scenario where I commonly see connected dot plots used in a business setting is when reporting survey data. So here's an example of that. In this case, we're looking at what they call the satisfaction gap. So it's the proportion of respondents who said that these aspects of the work environment were very important versus the proportion who said they were very satisfied with those same aspects. Uh, so we can use connected dot plots to um, illustrate differences here uh, between how people are responding on different items. You could also imagine flip-flopping that level of categorization and using a dot plot to compare groups uh, in the same way that we saw women and men with the smoking example for survey data as well. These were just a couple of examples. You'll find more examples uh, back in August 2018, which is actually where the examples here are drawn from. Our monthly storytelling with data challenge was on plots with dots. So you'll find a number of dot plots of the types we've discussed today there. Uh, you'll find that information at community.storytellingwithdata.com slash challenges. I also have a feeling you're going to see more dot plots of various types in John's forthcoming book, Better Data Visualizations. So definitely recommend checking that out. And John, thanks very much for having me here today. And for those watching, I hope you've enjoyed this mini lesson on dot plots. And thanks to Cole for that great review of the dot plot. It's one of my favorite graphs. It's sort of my go-to now. Instead of using a paired bar chart, I first start with a dot plot instead. I think it's lighter, there's more white space, and it doesn't get as dense and as cluttered as maybe a bar chart might. So I hope you enjoy that. I hope you'll be able to use a dot plot in your own work. So until next time, this has been the One Chart at a Time video series.